Good morning, and welcome to the First Existentialist Congregation of Atlanta. We are a philosophically based spiritual community founded on existential philosophy and feminist principles and dedicated to human liberation and the protection of the natural world. My name is Patton White, and I will be facilitating this morning's celebration of life. We make our spiritual home in the Old Stone Church, which was hand-built 100 years ago by the African-American Antioch East Baptist Church. We honor their labors of love and the powerful history of this special place. We acknowledge that our spiritual home stands on land forcibly taken from the Muscogee Creek people. We support justice and equality for all indigenous people. <clears throat> Our opening words this morning are a poem by one of our uh, longtime members, Sharon Sanders, who unfortunately passed away several years ago. But um, I ended up with a copy of her, her book called Teasing the Grace, Poems and Stories, written by Sharon Sanders uh, at her memorial service, actually, in our sanctuary. <clears throat> This is a poem entitled, Friends. We pour ourselves into each other like water poured from one cup to another, streaming a bridge of flashing water across the space. As I empty out, I fill you. Full, you return into my emptiness. The bridge is charged with newly made energy as we empty that which is full and fill that which is empty. Again, that's a poem called Friends by Sharon Sanders. This morning we have a wonderful treat. Um, this was actually a special request from our speaker, the Reverend Marty Keller. Uh, she made the request that we present the song Rock of Ages, which um, is a Jewish uh, piece. And so we reached out to Aviva, and Aviva has recorded this wonderful version specifically for us. So please join me in welcoming Aviva as she presents Rock of Ages. Hi, hey, y'all. We are going to rock out some Rock of Ages. Are you ready? Let me just pull the words up here. Meet my new friend, Gracious. Goodness gracious, here we go. Maut Tor Yeshu Ati Lichana Elishabea Ti Gompente Filati Visham to Dan Isabea Lie Tahimat Bea Mid Sor Hamna Bea Azigmor Bishir Mizmor Hanu Katam is Bea Azigmor Bishir Mizmor Hanu Katam is Bea English Rock of Ages, let our song praise thy saving power. Thou amidst the raging foes wast our sheltering tower. Furious they assailed us, but thine arms availed us, and thy word broke their sword when our own strength failed us and thy word broke their sword when our own strength failed us Hebrew again Maud Sor Yeshu Ati Lichana Elisha Bea Betefilati Bisham to da Nisabea Lieta Hima Bea Mitsor Hamna Bea 
a zig more, bishim is more, a nu katam is bea, a zig more, bishim is more, a nu katam is bea. English. Kindling knew the holy lamps, priest approved in suffering, purified the nation's shrine, brought to God their offering, and his court surrounding, here in joy abounding, happy throngs singing songs, with a mighty sounding, happy throng singing songs with a mighty sounding. Children of the martyr race, whether free or fettered, Wake the echoes of the songs where ye may be scattered. Yours the message cheering that the time is nearing which will see all men free, tyrants disappearing, which will see all women free. Tyrants disappearing. Mahotor Yeshua Ti, Lechana Elisha Beach, Tiko Betefilati, Visham Todan is a beach, the Mitzor Hamda Beach, A Zigmor Bishir Mizmor, Haduka Tamiz Beach, A Zigmor Bishir Mizmor, Haduka Tamiz Thank you so much, Aviva. And now on to our featured speaker. The Reverend Marty Keller has been a parish, community, and social justice minister for more than 23 years. Her Unitarian involvements include co-editing Jewish Voices in Unitarian Universalism and other UUA publications around the Jewish source of our living tradition. She has been the president of UUs for Jewish Awareness and is currently a board member. She is part of the ministerial team launching an online Musser Jewish Values program in 2022. She is also past vi vice president of the Society for Humanistic Judaism and serves on the advisory team for the International Secular Synagogue. Welcome, Marty Keller. The Ger German synagogue melody, Rock of Ages, led our song. Rock of Ages, led our song. Praise your saving power. You amid the raging foes were our sheltering tower. Kindling knew the holy lamps. Priests unbowed by suffering purified the nation's shrine. Kindling knew the holy lamps. There it is, the central ritual imperative of the Jewish holiday, Hanukkah. The light of eight candles. Light in a menorah, menorah, one for each night. There are other parts of Hanukkah, foods, games, family rituals, but the critical part, the critical, the critical central aspect of Hanukkah is the candles, it's the candles that are critical. Last year on our neighborhood Facebook page, a Jewish woman in the middle of the pandemic had, wrote that somehow she and her husband had forgotten to check on the status of their Hanukkah candles from the previous year, how many they had left in the box, and discovered when they finally checked that they had only had two days worth left. They had purchased them last year, only two days left. 
that when it was easier just to ride around from store to store at the last moment until you found some, when it was more, in fact, even possible to consider driving 50 or 20 minutes to borrow some extra candles from your cousins, maybe even have a drop-in visit. By the end of the day, fortunately, she had called around and she found a small supply remaining at the local Publix. So her holiday, her holy day disaster, was blessedly averted. Because you see, Hanukkah does call for 36 candles, eight for each night of this festival of lights, and actually 44, because you have to include the kindling lights, to mark an ancient winter festival for the Jewish people. Like many religious festivals, Hanukkah stems from a pagan festival, a pagan festival that turned into a minor, and it was really for many years, a very minor commemoration of a guerrilla war of liberation from oppression and religious degradation, at least according to those guerrillas, and increasingly has burst into a more major and commercialized celebration, complete with this miracle, this miracle of the one lamp, the one light that should have lasted one day, 24 hours, lasting for eight whole days, long enough for them to secure the temple and win their victory. And a gambling game with spinning tops and tradles and the gelt and the gifts and all the things that have become beloved, especially for small children, especially around Christmas. I had gone through the same candle crisis the week before, finding only four forlorn leftover candles in my old box, but I managed to secure from some from Amazon just in time. Before that, I too had put out the call on social media, and I was so touched by the sweet notes from my Jewish friends and colleagues all over the country, some of them saying, we wish you lived next door so we could just bring some over. And a rather stern message from a progressive rabbi colleague of mine who said, why are you beating yourself? Because you think you're going to fall short. Given what's going on now, you should use any candle you can find. doesn't have to be candles from that set of candles from the grocery store that fit your particular menorah. After all, he reminded me, and I eventually reminded myself, the Jews in concentration camps in the midst of the Holocaust, the depth of the Holocaust, saved scraps of fat from their food and used loose threads to form makeshift wicks st stuck in a carved sweet potato. That was their candles. That was their menorah. And they managed to keep this ritual going, this custom going, this symbol of Judaism and Jew Jewishness going, despite where they were in time. Light is light eight nights of it, the simplest, holiest form of Hanukkah. I used to rail against reducing Hanukkah to just another festival of lights, a universal festival of lights. Now that I see its history is so troubled, its actual history, its mythical history, pitting orthodoxy versus hybrid culture, integration of culture, I think that, that troublesome aspects of Hanukkah and the militarism are in one place, but the miracle that is light prevails for me now. So yes, amidst the Holocaust horrors, historians tell us that many Jews still found ways to mark Hanukkah, keeping that holy light blazing over the century, wherever they were. There was little room for light, for example, in Terhensenstadt, where some 140,000 Czech Jews came through the Nazi camp. It was like a human holding pen on the way to even worse almost one in four eventually succumbing to disease or starvation, those who survived moving on to still more terrible places like Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. Yet still, in 1942, late 1942, one inmate stole a large block of wood from a Nazi and carved what was described as an ornate Hanukkah, the special menorah or candle holder, which was quite impressive by all tellings. Other Jews in other ghettos and camps found ways to kindle a flame and still celebrate the holiday. In Warsaw, in the Warsaw Ghetto, for example, behind closed curtains, joyfully lighting the family menorahs that would have to be left behind when they were either uh, transported to some of these death camps or if they were caught and killed in the Warsaw Uprising. And later, after 
the war and liberation in Westerbork, a transit camp in the Netherlands. Uh, it, people living there and making menorahs out of wood and aluminum foil with grease and cotton wicks serving as their candles. In another, a lamp made out of cartridge scraps and shell casings dedicated to the American military who had liberated them, not just the American military in general, but the specific general who had liberated them. And on the, the Hanukkah candle holder was inscribed, a great miracle happened here. Not only that they could celebrate Hanukkah, but that they were alive to celebrate Hanukkah. Recent surveys have revealed how many younger people in particular have an astonishingly limited knowledge of the Holocaust, the genocide of millions of Jews and other people. Even fewer of any age place this horrific event in the context of thousands of years of systemic violent persecution against a people whose holidays and life celebrations, whose public holidays and life celebrations made them vulnerable to brutal attacks, whose lights by the necessity of survival often did have to be hidden, but whose rituals were maintained in some fashion, generation after generation. Years before the final solution of the Jews, the plan to exterminate this entire population, families like mine and my husband lived in that fear and lived in the courage of maintaining those, those rituals. His grandmother from Romania brought a dinghy brass menorah with her to this country, dingy, and a, seat, and a tea kettle, two things that we actually have. I don't know what else survived her. Leaving behind her drab Eastern European town where the Jews have largely vanished now, decimated first by the exodus to an America and, and Israel to keep them safe, then by the Holocaust of the forest where they did not get go to camps were actually murdered right outside the town walls and by decades of communist repression routinely persecuted for practicing their religion for lighting candles for celebrating Passover for all of those rituals that made them who they were a handful of Jewish people a very few synagogues survive not quite completely broken after hundreds of years, here and there a menorah lit, here and there. In 1998, Hanukkah was celebrated for the first time in Spain since its Jewish population was decimated by the Inquisition and expulsion more than 500 years ago. The ritual lighting of a 15-foot menorah on the eighth and final day in the old Jewish quarter of Girona in the town square attracted more than 1,000 people, including many non-Jews, because it was a demonstration of only recently established religious tolerance laws. Only in 1992 did Spain finally put Islam and Protestant Christianity and Judaism on equal footing with the Roman Catholic Church with its predominant Catholicism and its centuries of cruel record of domination and subjugation. 1492, we know, was a terrible year for the native people in the Americas. It was also a terrible year for the Jewish people on the Iberian Peninsula as well. In Spain today, there may be 25,000 Jews compared with more than 200,000 when the Roman Catholic monarchs, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, issued what they called the Edict of Expulsion. They wanted Spain to be in the Iberian Peninsula to be entirely Roman Catholic and ordered all Jews, even those who had converted to Christianity, to be able to remain in Spain. They were ordered to leave the country in three months' time. This followed years already of mob looting and destroying Jewish synagogues and homes, economic hardship, famine, this forced conversion, torture, and burning at the stake. Most of the Jews left for Portugal, out of which they were expelled four years later, and on to North Africa and Italy and France and England and other places from which they were also ex largely expelled and wandered and wandered. The la last Spanish Inquisition death was recorded in 1926, and the Office of Inquisition officially closed only in 1992 when the Olympics came to Barcelona with offers now largely very qualified or rescinded of Spanish, Spanish citizenship to the descendants of Sephardic Jews who were forced out centuries ago. Before COVID derailed this, 
My husband and I were set earlier this fall to attend a Rhodes Scholar course on the secret Jews who found their ways to the, to the Americas, to New Mexico in the Southwest territories of what was called originally New Spain. Today, there are thousand conversos, at least 1,500 families living in more, largely small Hispanic towns in the high desert communities around Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Writer Trudy Al Alexi tells us that the strength of their connections to Judaism and their own awareness of it vary greatly from family to family. Some of the obviously Jewish, re um, Jewish connected Jew Jewish customs they continue to observe, she notes, have been so modified over time that they're barely recognizable. We've always done this, people would say. We're Catholics. We're devout Catholics. We've always done these things. We've always had these rituals. But there was very little remaining understanding of how directly they were related to Judaism and their Jewishness. While the official uh, educational program was indeed called off, my husband and I made the trip and had the privilege of spending an entire afternoon with a rabbi, one of the instructors, and a non-denominational religious leader with deep connections to these conversos whose hidden Jewish practices have included not working on the Sabbath, a Jew, obviously a Jewish custom, not eating pork or pork products, a Jewish custom, having two sets of dishes, an Orthodox Jewish custom, praying three times a day facing east, putting Jewish symbols on their graves, and lighting long burning candles in church on Friday, on Shabbat whose strategies for staying hidden in small Hispanic towns included appearing extra-religious, extra-Catholic, attending Mass scrupulously, regularly, having a priest as a member of their family, and keeping pigs as pets so as not to draw so much attention to why they did not eat pig meat. After 20 generations, they have continued to persist, even after being chased by the Inquisition into the new land, even after years of hiding their identity, of imprisonment and torture, of burnings, even in the new land, looking always over their shoulders. Many of them remaining still devout Catholics, even when they learn they have Jewish roots. Some of them, though, emerging approaching local synagogues, not knowing even what it might mean to be a member, to be a real a Jewish, Jewish, a religiously observant Jew, and navigating the complicated religious and cultural identities that come with this. Keeping the courage memory intact, the courage of maintaining rituals, and the fear memory as well, hiding these in order to survive, especially in the face of an overwhelming Catholic hierarchy in New Mexico and the current persistent anti-Semitism there and really all over, all over. Dove Wilker, a regional director of the American Jewish Committee, wrote recently an opinion column about rising Jewish hatred on our streets, in our schools, and expressed by elected officials across the political spectrum. This may explain, he proposed, why 90% of American Jews believe that anti-Semitism is a problem in this country and why an overwhelming majority of them, 82%, say it's increased over the last five years. According to the 2021 American Jewish Committee report on anti-Semitism, which was released three years after the Tree of Life synagogue massacre in Pittsburgh, the single deadliest attack on Jewish people in this country in our history. Sadly, almost a quarter of the survey Jews have avoided publicly wearing or carrying or displaying items that might help people identify them as being Jewish, their lights literally and metaphorically still being hidden. In my town, a town that for 30 years, beginning in the t early in the 20th century, basically barred Jews from living there, next to another town that only permitted white Christians to be residents, it's written in their town charter, there are beginning to be more Jewish people. I was pleasantly surprised recently that the neighborhood elementary school is offering Hanukkah candles in their holiday gift catalog. And when I picked up my box from a Jewish woman, she was surprised that I was surprised they were in there. My son, who's 35 years old and grew up in that school system as a Jewish kid, there was no way that that catalog would have been as inclusive. Nonetheless, there, there are Jewish families in this town who don't understand why only Christmas lights and wreaths are city-sponsored, city-paid, where while Hanukkah and, the, and their holiday rituals are not being honored in what they believe, they believed and still believe, 
is a diverse town. When asked on social media whether Jewish families intended to place their minorities, their menorahs on their windows, some said emphatically no, it felt too dangerous. This even with the fear memory of a family in Billings, Montana some years back when black Native, and, Native American and Jewish families became the targets of intimidation. When a brick thrown the window, through the window of a six-year-old Jewish boy who had placed his family menorah in the living room window, led to 10,000 menorahs in Billings, Montana, placed in windows, Jews and non-Jews alike standing against hate and bigotry. The Anti-Defamation League urges us, Jews and non-Jews alike, to keep light continuing to shine bright long after the eight days of Hanukkah. They remind us that while the Hanukkah wax might drip and the wick burn away, the opportunity for multi-community collaboration is wide open to build safer and more inclusive communities. Because silence is acceptance, our response must be quick and clear. We must let people who have been harmed know that they are not alone. We must make our stand against hate broadly visible for as long as possible, and we must not back down. What is the definition of courage? The state or quality of mind or spirit that enables one to face danger and fear or vicissitudes with self-possession, confidence, and resolution. The definition of courage is to be a light. Thank you so much, Marty, for your words, as always. Please join us on Zoom immediately following this broadcast, where we will have our meet and greet. We will discuss the themes and ideas that uh, Marty has shared with us this morning, as well as sharing personal joys, sorrows, and concerns, and community announcements. You can find the link to the Zoom meeting in the chat section of today's broadcast. Next week, we will be welcoming back Franklin Abbott with his talk, Life is a Risk Worth Taking. We hope to see you either on Zoom or next week at 11 a.m. And until then, we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day today, a wonderful weekend, and a wonderful week in the days ahead. Thank you so much for being with us. Bye-bye.